I'm Deborah Stipek, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. Uh, we're going to talk about the Congressional Fellowship Program that AERA has. They, we bring up to three doctoral level education researchers to Washington, D.C. each year to work closely with policymakers and staff on Capitol Hill. And I just wanted to mention that AERA seeks candidates for this fellowship from every level of your, of your career. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the fellowship that I had. But today we have former and current fellows who are going to share with you a little bit about their experience, what they're learning, uh, how it's contributing to their careers. Uh, and there will be plenty of time for you to ask questions about application and about the experiences that you might have and how it might fit into your own career plans. Um, so the, we're going to start by having each person just give just a few minutes of where they're, where, what they're doing and uh, how that's connected to their research interests and their other career interests. So I'm going to start with mine. I'm not going to tell you when I did my fellowship. It actually predates the AERA fellowship. Uh, it was an SRCD fellowship, but it's very much along the same lines. And I did it mid-career. Um, I was already uh, uh, in, in a pr professorial role, uh, but I really wanted to understand policy better because I was very interested in doing the kind of work that might actually be useful to policymakers. I worked for Bill, Senator Bill Bradley from New Jersey. Anybody here from New Jersey? Yes. You probably don't even remember Bill Bradley because it was quite a few years ago. He was a lot of people. When I worked for him, people said, oh, you mean the basketball player? And I said, no, the senator, because he was also a basketball player, very well known. Um, <clears throat> I did work on education, gender issues, Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, I learned about durable medical equipment which um, I happily have never had to be informed about, but I do know about it now just by working on the Finance Committee. I was considered a specialist. So I think that's an important point because when you're working on the Hill, the breadth of the topics that you address goes way beyond what the, the, the way most researchers are used to working. Um, <clears throat> it was an extraordinary experience. I really recommend it to everyone. And I want to mention that the AERA uh, fellowship is part of a larger set of science fellowships that AAAS takes some responsibility for. So when you get to Washington, you're actually working to some degree in, and taking some seminars and having some opportunities to interact with people from other, with other, uh, from other scientific organizations, which I think is a real benefit of the program. So I'm going to start with you because you have to leave. And um, each former and current fellow is going to introduce themselves and then tell you a little bit about what they're doing or have done. Good morning. I think it's still morning. My name is Lori Diane Hill. I am Associate Executive Director at AERA for Programs and Policy. And it is my pleasure to be here, particularly for the occasion of anything that features or celebrates our congressional fellows, past and present. So I have to offer my apologies because I am, in this case, only double booked. It is not unusual for me to be triple booked over the course, <laughs> of, this, over the course of this meeting. But I did want to take an opportunity to first acknowledge the fact that it has been my pleasure to have an opportunity to participate in the launching of a program that's been a real long time dream and part of an important vision for our executive director, Felice Levine. And this program came to be because it was um, embraced as an important initiative by AERA Council. And I think even more broadly as a really significant dimension of AERA's long-time articulated mission to, um, to be actively engaged with diverse publics and to be actively engaged in policy. And we are certainly not the first uh, professional society to 
offer a congressional fellowship, but we are beyond excited about it because it gives our membership at whatever stage of their career progression what we absolutely view as a, a mutually beneficial placement and opportunity that is for um, very able and engaged and thoughtful scholars of our field to be placed, as they will tell you, um, not perhaps as specialists, but essentially as members of a larger staff that is driving either an, an office or a committee um, in ways that uh, don't so much resemble their own professional lives. And it's an opportunity for breadth of exposure for people who have good minds and are good problem solvers and can work collaborative, collaboratively. But it's also an opportunity for a, an up-close view of what education researchers might bring to bear on some of the most important prob problems, issues, and challenges, not just as they relate to education-specific issues, but as they relate to policy more broadly. So th that's the aspect of this that we are particularly excited about. And uh, we cheer each cohort as they move through and learn a great deal from them about how to enhance, develop, frame, and adjust, if necessary, the program. So I hope you will take this opportunity to engage and learn from people who are recently through or actively engaged in this experience. And you should feel free, in addition to asking them questions, to reach out to me or to police if you have an interest in the program and want to learn more. So we really thank you for being here. And with that, I will ask you to excuse me. Just go down the row here. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jenna Sablon. I'm currently an assistant research professor at Georgetown University in the McCourt School of Public Policy. Uh, I was uh, the inaugural AERA Congressional Fellow in 2016-17, and um, I, um, so I was the first uh, Congressional Fellow uh, that was selected, and I served on the Senate Budget Committee under uh, Ranking Member Senator Ber Bernie Sanders. And my background is in higher education policy, college access, um, uh, financial aid issues, um, college readiness uh, issues, and so um, I think we're talking about where we were placed and and uh, and our responsibilities, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, I, and on the Senate Budget Committee, um, I sort of uh, was uh, paired with the main education staffer for the senator and had sort of a dual role of um, working with the education staffer on education legislation for the senator as well as um, anything education related on the Senate Budget Committee. Um, so it was a really fascinating experience because um, I didn't know much about the congressional budget process, um, but I got to learn a lot about issues around budget resolutions, budget reconciliation, how those things affect um, policy making. Um, and uh, I was there in terms of context. Um, I started in September 2016, and then November 2016 <laughs> happened. Um, so <laughs> I I was um, on the Hill in the first uh, year of the Trump administration, and um, it was a really interesting time. Um, and uh, my member also is. Um, a member of the HELP Committee as well, which is the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee in the Senate, which is the main um, committee of jurisdiction for education issues. So we processed the nomination for the Secretary of Education. So um, 
uh, you know, I also got to work on those sorts of issues. So um, it was a really uh, great experience to sort of get exposure to um, <clears throat> committee issues as well as um, congressional office issues and, and legislative writing issues. So um, maybe I'll just leave it at that and other things will come up as people go along. Cool. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Kendrick uh, Davis. Um, if you see me shuffling in this chair, they're uniquely uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my placement is with Senator Kamala Harris. Um, I think it's pronounced Kamala like the punctuation. Uh, so everybody in this room, from this moment forward, you will pronounce her name correctly. Um, so she, there's a, a sort of unique aspect of being in the office, uh, unrelated to the, the presidential campaign, but being in the office of a junior uh, member um, just comes with unique opportunities for both the disorganization, but also um, sort of entrepreneurial uh, sort of adventures. Um, I was sort of brought on, at least the way it was explained to me, was I was brought on to sort of like begin to formulate an educational um, agenda uh, for the member. Um, she sits on the Intelligence, uh, Homeland Security, and Judiciary uh, Committees. Um, and so one of the, th those are the things that she was steeped into early in her, her time on, on the Hill. Um, and what I've had the, the pleasure of doing is uh, finding sort of educational issues that are uh, either close to the work she's doing those committees or close to the work that she did as, uh, as AG in California or district attorney in San Francisco. For example, um, the, when the shooting happened in, in uh, Parkland, Florida, the Trump administration created the Federal Commission of School Safety and one of the commission's recommendations was to rescind the Obama era school discipline um, guidance. Um, and so that was one of the areas where um, we teamed up with uh, another Congressional Black Caucus member uh, to do a school discipline, uh, to do a school discipline bill. And that was something that was um, a slight pivot, but something that was comfortably um, in her wheelhouse and something that would potentially go through a uh, judiciary um, committee. I think there are, there are both benefits and drawbacks to working on issues that are within the committees of jurisdiction of, of your member. Um, I think the fact that our West Senator is not on, on help but it also creates an opportunity for us to do sort of messaging um, and sort of send signals through legislation that's not sort of hampered by, well, maybe hampered's not the right word, but it's not sort of, doesn't have to be vetted through um, a committee. Um, and we, so part of our, I think, responsibilities that, that I've sort of undertaken are sort of like writing letters of inquiry or, or oversight to different departments, mostly the Department of Education, but there's some issues that sort of span out to like Veterans Affairs and other people who have access to federal financial aid. Um, uh, writing legislation uh, and just really kind of being creative and, and exercising those sort of like innovative juices to find uh, what are the best ways to um, what are the best ways to, to go about addressing issues and what are the sort of niche areas that uh, that the senator can carve out uh, for herself um, and my uh, my background is both in engineering um, and education so uh, there are I work on like education issues but also like labor and workforce um, and I'm currently like working on some uh, STEM bills because I think we need to do more in STEM. So uh, take the opportunity to, to do that and, and more. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zewe Serpel. I am a tenured associate professor of psychology at Virginia Commonwealth University. And I was in the second cohort uh, that included four people. So I was an associate professor. It was a full professor. There was a postdoc, and there was a fresh PhD. Um, so they, it, the, the fellowship really does cross the span of, of, of where you are in your career. Um, I am a K-12 person. I study student learning. Um, I'm very interested in school-based interventions that target uh, executive functioning. Um, and before I went on this fellowship, I always thought of policy as just a barrier. It was just a headache. It set the, the, the time, the calendar for when testing happened with students, which got in the way of implementation of my project. <laughs> so it just was a headache. Um, and then I was invited by AERA somewhat randomly. In fact, when they called me, I said, why did you call me? Um, <laughs> to come and do a day on the hill. I was like, okay, day on the hill, sure. Um, it was possibly the most shocking and unpleasant day of my entire career. <laughs> I went and I, I just was not prepared for 
sitting in a room and being given 15 minutes with a person probably the age of the average undergraduate junior on two cell phones saying, and, and now what? what? What is it you have to say? Everybody looked bored. I had the wrong language for communication. Um, so that was the experience I had a year before I applied for the fellowship. So you might ask, well, why on earth did you apply for the fellowship? <laughs> um, I came out of that experience thinking, I have no idea what happens in that world. I have no clue. Um, so I applied because my two projects were done. I was mid-career, and I was like, you know, this is a good time for me to learn something new. So that's why I applied. My placement was on the House Committee on Education and the Workforce. Um, the ranking member was Bobby Scott, um, and he also happened to be the member of the district in Virginia in which I lived, which was very helpful. Um, I spent the year um, crafting legislation, um, but legislation that had nothing to do with K-12. So I got there thinking I was a K-12 person, <clears throat> and I got there and they were like, well, you've been at three different institutions. You kind of know something about higher ed. And I was like, yes, I kind of know something about higher ed. I've been in higher ed for about 15 years. Um, so they're like, yeah, we want you to do higher ed issues. And in fact, we're going to put you in charge of the portfolio on institutional accountability and accreditation. So I know more about accreditation than I ever knew as a faculty member. So I spent the year um, writing legislation, but also doing all the work that goes with that. So spending an, a lot of time doing research on areas, reading bills from offices, um, collating information from groups who came in, and the groups vary in what constituency they come from. You might have, I had groups of faculty come and they would say, oh, send the fellow in. Go, <laughs> she knows what they're about <laughs> because we have real issues as faculty communicating to policymakers. So they would send me in and I would close the door and say, okay, now the secret is, this is what, how you have to talk to the staff. Um, I spent uh, so a lot of time messaging what the value system of the committee was about and how that translated to, into um, kind of legislative, uh, a, a legislative agenda, but also uh, gathering information so that I knew what needed to be adjusted in the legislation that we were crafting to meet constituencies' needs uh, or tap into their interests or recognize if we were going to get pushed back on any part of legislation. Uh, so lots and lots of meetings with lots of different people. Um, I spent an inordinate amount of time taking notes at the Department of Education, real-time notes so that the staff could do their work in the office and I would be typing in a Google Doc so that they could follow the conversation in real time so that they could cre respond and be ready to respond. Um, I wrote um, stuff that went to the media. So lots of different kind of writing, writing that I was not prepared for as an academic. Um, writing Everything that I wrote other than the legislation <coughs> was less than a page. And so everything had to be communicated in a very short amount of space. So yeah, and that's, it was a very busy, very busy year. When I arrived, um, the Republicans had just dropped their PROSPER Act, which is, it was the big reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. So within a month I was in markup and then at the end of my fellowship experience, um, Congressman Scott um, decided he wanted to put a big piece of counter legislation forward. So I left as we dropped the Higher Aim Act, um, which is his version, or the, it was the De Democrats' version of um, that reauthorization bill. I have two stories about writing. When I interviewed with Bill Bradley, his first question was, do you write like an academic? <laughs> and I knew what the right answer was. I said, oh, no, not at all. <laughs> and he said, right answer. And then I was told as soon as I started that anything that was more than a, could be put on a three by five card, don't bother him with it. Yeah. So you do learn how to be very succinct mm -hmm. and uh, write in a more journalistic way, which I think 
benefits us all, even if mm -hmm. all we do is go back into academia. Yeah, absolutely. But that is, and I had one question I wanted to ask you. How many of you knew what a markup was before you went to the Hill? Oh, I had no idea. So it, you also learn a lot of language, which then once yeah. in a while now I see these things in the New York Times, it's like, oh, I know what that is. I know is. what that is. <laughs> you yeah. know what they're talking about. Okay, let's keep going. Okay. Uh, I, I'm Daniel Elkert, and I'm going to change the direction a little bit. So I currently don't work in a congressional office for AERA. Uh, my association is with the American Statistical Association. So we're about 20,000 members. Um, as you can imagine, predominantly statisticians and quantitatively oriented scientists. Uh, but I operate in-house within our association. And, and what that means is that I, the scope of my work tasks are to generally elevate the profile of federal statistics in federal science policymaking. So for folks who are unfamiliar with what that federal statistical system is, it's a series of agencies like the Census and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I think most closely connected here at AERA is NCES, or the National Center for Education Statistics. And so um, I've done quite a bit of work in, uh, since I've started in, in each of those areas. Um, but I think what's unique about a position like mine is uh, I do a lot of Hill meetings, not necessarily on behalf of a member of Congress, because I don't work in Congress, but I, I meet with a lot of staff members and on, on occasion, when the issue raises high enough with, with a member. Um, and so one of the things that's valuable, I think, about the experience that I'm having is I get that kind of outside perspective. And so I can take on um, kind of a strong advocacy role in my position. Uh, there's also a lot of opportunity to collaborate with relevant stakeholders in the broader scientific community, educational research community, who I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. So there are associations like COSA, the Consortium for Social Science Associations, and COPAFS, which is the broader Federal Statistics Association, among just a number of other groups uh, that all have these representatives that are, are really interested in how to support evidence-based policy in federal science um, and, and broadly. And so I think for our, for our purposes here today, I'd be happy to talk more about NCES. I'm doing a lot of work right now on the outside, um, trying to advocate for changes in the way that their budget is structured, specifically their salaries and expenditures line, to maximize kind of their in-house expertise um, and uh, help to account for some loss in, in funding through inflation that's occurred since 2009. So that's a little bit of, about my background. It's a little bit of a different perspective as someone who's operating kind of outside of Congress with a lot of different stakeholder associations. So. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Feldman. Um, I did my PhD in education policy studies, did a postdoc, and then am now in the fellowship. I work um, for Senator Bob Casey from Pennsylvania. Um, and I specifically chose that office because he is very big in social domestic policy, and that was really important to me. So it was also important to me to have a member who was on the help committee because my goal in coming here was to really understand process, right? As someone who actually studies policy and really thinks about how that impacts people um, on the ground and how they understand it, learning how this process unfolds was really important to me. So I've consistently paid attention to how things are working. And so through that, it was, like I said, important to me to kind of have that committee experience. Um, you know, the brief version, which I think you've heard people talk about, is that you're doing a myriad of things. You're doing a myriad of things at once. Um, <laughs> and one of the biggest challenges I've been having has been just doing like the pace, <laughs> right? And trying to keep up that you want to go into depth. You want to be able to understand all of these pieces. And it's just not quite how things work. And yet, all of these staffers seem to know about all of these pieces. And I'm just like, I don't know how you understand <laughs> about all of these different things that are moving at the same time and trying to keep up when I need flashcards. Um, so my life involves going to help meetings. It involves writing legislation. It involves following that process um, along. Uh, and keeping track of things, I think, is one of the bigger things. Like, you think something happens and then 
you send the email and then it's gone, but that's actually not what happens. You have to remember to go back and follow up on that email. Um, and there's timelines that are short. And, um, and so it's been, you know, that it's been meeting with constituents. Um, I think the biggest thing that I've been paying a lot of attention to is how uh, the entire office is basically, we are Team Casey. And, um, and so everything we do is in service to the senator and to moving how uh, his priorities forward and also kind of how we are going to um, move our priorities through his priorities forward. And so it's constantly thinking about what does he need to know? Um, what do we need to make sure gets to him? Um, what do we need to handle without him? Um, and understanding where those lines are and what the responsibilities are of um, of the senator that we each have a role to play on this team and um, and how those all fit. So that's kind of where I've been spending a lot of time thinking about and moving. My portfolio has been in both uh, disability and in education. Um, my do not have a background in disability uh, work. It has been phenomenal to learn about. It has been phenomenal to meet with those constituents and, um, and the different advocacy organizations and understand their concerns and learn about things like the fact that when you vote, right, that there's a whole big push to um, think through um, automatic voting machines and the downside of those in terms of recording, um, in terms of recording people's votes and the issue is, is with you're someone with a disability, that might be the only way that you can vote um, on your own. And so there can be tensions in ways that you wouldn't necessarily expect. And so really trying to think through all of those tensions and then um, not necessarily coming up with the answer at that moment, but, um, but broadly thinking about that and also having to commit, I think, as academics. Uh, we're really good at saying yes and, or in this situation, this might not be how we would think something through. And like, this has been something that um, personal growth wise has been phenomenal to be able to kind of stake a claim and say this is what is this happening is what and is. and this is how things have to go and right. um, it's really uncomfortable for me um, yeah. but it's been like it's been really powerful to you know like we are working in their space and um, I have incredible mentors um, and and taking what I know has been useful, but really trying to be humble that like they know this world, and and my job is to understand their world and that they are opening that up to me. And so I've been um, really appreciative of all of the ways that they have guided me through in that, and uh, continue to kind of ramp up what my responsibilities are over time. And um, yeah, and each office is just so different <laughs> um, and operates so differently. And um, it's been great. It's been really powerful. So I have a question. Quite a, almost everyone has mentioned meeting with constituents. Mm -hmm. So another way of saying that is meeting with lobbyists, right? Because oh, yeah. many it's people. It's part of it. So <clears throat> what has what is your view of constituents, lobbyists? Um, what has been your experience working on the Hill, and your has it affected the way you think about the people who go to the Hill to try to push for particular kinds of legislation? Anyone? Yeah, uh, it, it's, uh, it had a profound effect on me, actually. And uh, part of it is because you no longer, t you, you have to understand what the ask is mm -hmm. before you even enter the room. And so you, you start to boil people down to where they lie on a position <laughs> and what they're advocating for and how that fits within your member's agenda. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't fit, you're there to listen to their argument so that you can develop an effective counter argument. And so the, it's, a, it's not a passive process mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. My experience was that everybody came in and there was an ask. And mm -hmm. if you didn't get to the ask quick enough, it was just a wasted meeting. So you listened carefully for, okay, what is, what is being asked of me? And that changed my perspective a lot. And it also, those meetings are not just listening to the ask, it's also your opportunity to message your position. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, there's a lot of strategy in those meetings which seem very casual when you go in. Yeah. It's like everybody's saying, hi, and how's, how's your day been? And um, you, know, you quickly progress. You've got about 10 minutes. You need to know the ask. You need to counter or provide some messaging. Um, so 
the term lobbying now makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, before I was like, oh, I guess people go and say what's important to them, but it's, it's more than that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to come in on that? I think I've sort of like started grouping constituent meetings into, and our office is, is unique because, um, because of the sort of high profile nature of the member I work for, there are lobbies who come in with specific ask and policy proposals. There are people who come in with an idea of what they want to talk about, and they're sort of like looking for your help and like filling it out. And then there are people who just want to breathe the same air <laughs> as, as, as the member. And it, it sort of varies in sort of like how, um, uh, and how you sort of like move and navigate through that meeting. One of the things I think, because I used to work in local, local government um, in the mayor's office in Philly, and one of the things I'm very big on is making sure you show proper deference and respect to constituents, even those people who are just like have no idea what they want to talk about, and they just this is their first time, and, and they just they need your help in in, in helping them, um, because you are you may be the closest they ever get to meeting with the the elected official that they voted for or that they're looking to to help them. So I, think, I really think it's important for even those people who you know they set a meeting at three o'clock and they show up at three thirty. That you you know try in some ways to to accommodate their um, their ask and their and their interest um, because it's I think it's important just for them to particularly for members who come from or constituents who come from California there are people who will take a six hour flight just to sit in a room for fifteen minutes with you and that in and of itself is something that sort of will kind of help center and ground you in how you decide to mm -hmm. um, to deal with things um, and my favorite meetings are probably with not favorite, but the most efficient meetings are those with lobbyists who come in and say, I know you don't have a lot of time. When you start off with that, that is my favorite. Like, I'm probably going to love you. They say, I know you don't have a lot of time. They slide a, a, a folder across the table and say, these are the summary of my ask. Do you have any questions for me? I might just give you a hug. <laughs> I might just give you a hug. Um, but to be honest, one of, some of my favorite meetings are with students. Uh, you, you know, you meet with and you interact with, with adults all the time. They're, they're like student groups, they come, they're, they're, they're unencumbered by sort of what, the, what they think policy should be and how they should talk and how they should dress and, and sort of all the, the sort of boxes people uh, put them into. And they just come in and they're raw. And they're, they're raw, they're passionate, uh, they'll tell you what's on their mind, uh, they'll probably care very little how it comes out. And that, that's what I love, it's like, I feel like this is, this is your place, this is your office, this is your space, um, and you should feel comfortable um, in it. Have any of you used lobbyists as a source of information? Absolutely. Well, have you? Oh, yeah. yes. yes. I mean, I think as a source of information, I think also as um, as a tool. And I think, but I think that we have to be careful about like what we're talking about: lobbyists and constituents, because those are actually not yeah. the same thing. Right. Well, people um, who had a point of view that they wanted you to adopt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yes, and like this is actually I, I really have, like. So I'm going to tell you the story of like the biggest mistake that I've made so far. Um, and it's, I think, relevant to academics because it shows both like where kind of we come from and like this world in which you're operating in. And, um, and I will keep it brief. But the long short of it is like, right, that when you when we we were we're in the process of developing a bill, and the bill is like going to be introduced soon. And it is the constituent group that it impacts. We want to make sure that they're on board and that they care about this. And there's some tension there, like. We are pushing them in a direction that we think is really important, and there is some tension. So they come in and they say, you know, they ask our scheduling office, and they want to know, like, can they meet with the center? And basically, as Kendrick's pointing out, like those meetings, they're like, the senator's really busy, and you will be ta like, if you you will be talking to the staffer, and everyone is really grateful, and everyone understands that that's kind of the process of how this works. Well, this comes through my desk, and I'm like, actually, we may want to meet with this group, and we may want to leverage the senator because we're trying to get this bill passed, and we'd like the constituents to actually buy in, and getting the senator is useful for that. So, like I said, everyone kind of plays a role, and so thinking of how you leverage your senator for that role, and so we decide among the scheduling team, among the press team, among the legislative staff that we're going to do that. And so we go in, and to go in and prep a senator, like I have had to write these memos that are only a page long, right? I have had to put in that memo, I have had to talk to them and been like, who is going to be at that meeting, right? Anyone who could be there. Like, are there going to be lobbyists filtering into that? Like, how are that, is that going to play out? I've had to let him know, like, 
what their asks are, what their agenda is going to be. I've had to let them know how that fits in with our agenda. And then I've had to make sure that like any landmines that are going to happen, like we've identified them so that he is walking into that meeting knowing the stats, knowing everything that's going to be happening. So I do all of that. He's prepped. My boss like loves statistics, loves knowing the facts. So like he knows that stuff down. I don't know how his memory works because think about all of the different issues they have to know. Walks into that meeting. We've already started the meeting. They've been like, they've handed us the child stuff that the kids did that, you know, all the fat smiley stuff. And then they come up and they go, hey, like, have you heard about this bill? And I did not prep him on this bill. I did not know they were going to bring this up. I did not know it was going to be happening. And I go into, and he says something to that effect, which is like the first thing of uh oh, because like that's, you know, he's supposed to know because I'm supposed to have told him. And so it turns to me of like what question I ask, and I make the fatal researcher mistake, and I ask them, well, what is it about this bill that you di dislike? Now, what is the fatal mistake that I just made? Because as a researcher, you want to know more information. The fatal mistake is that my job is to control this meeting, and my job is to make sure that all of that gets handled outside the pur purview of the senator. Right? That's not where this is supposed to happen. And I just opened him up to having to find about something else that I needed to handle without him even being there. Bye, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, so like things will be fine, it will be okay, but it's a very different way of thinking about how you operate in a meeting and what kind of information you're handling and how that works. And that needed to be something that happened offline with them separately and not with the center who was being deployed in a strategic way. So constituents work in both directions. Um, uh, I'm not going to ask people to do this, but I am sure that everyone sitting here is saying, oh, you think that was a mistake? I've got an even better one. So um, we all, you know, and I think, I think the, uh, the people we work for on the Hill understand that we are somewhat novices. Although I, I should say that uh, what, the one thing that I was, I was going to ask you what most surprised you, I'm going to tell you what most surprised me, and that is that this country is run by 22-year-olds. That's right. Um, <laughs> so That's right. now they're actually 25 in the Senate. But in the House, most of the people who are doing all this work that you've described, and it's, they are in very powerful roles, folks. So if you really want to lobby, here's the people to talk to. They are in very powerful roles because they, they control the information that gets to their boss and they control to some degree the information that gets out of that office. Mm. Uh, and the relationships with constituents and, and, and so on, they're writing the legislation. So they're, they're in very powerful positions. Uh, and most of them in the House are, what, 22 to 24 mm -hmm. and a little bit older in the Senate. But these are the people who are running this country. Just saying. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest surprise to me. Does anybody want to share their biggest surprise? Um, I would say that um, my biggest surprise was, um, I don't think it might be just my hair, um, that, uh, you know, I, so I did my undergrad at American University in Washington, D.C., and um, uh, so I knew a lot of people who had interned on the Hill, but um, coming from my um, sort of family financial background, that wasn't ever an option for me because most of them are um, unpaid. And so even though like I had these aspirations to work in policy, um, it was very difficult to have those opportunities. And so um, I knew a little bit about like Hill interns and, and kind of that role. And so I was kind of wondering like, is this an internship? Um, and um, so I, I didn't know kind of what you would be doing. And um, I was really surprised about the level of access and the level of responsibilities that I was given. Um, Cause I was really thought like, oh, they're, they're just gonna put me in a corner and you know, kind of that's gonna be it. But um, my, the education staffer that I worked with, I mean, he he was a really great mentor, and basically I was, you know, side by side, his twin, um, you know, as a team member. And so, you know, like writing legislation and um, contributing to memos that were going to the senator and um, staffing um, the nomination hearing for the Secretary of Education. And it was like, you know, so to me that was like most surprising was sort of that, um, 
like you said, that kind of level of influence or that level of responsibility, um, you know, that because of, you know, it, it wasn't just sort of like a hill internship and it, it was really like you were really um, um, kind of influencing things and crafting things. Like a regular staff member. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else want to say what they were surprised I'll, by? I'll jump in really quick. So I think the, one of the pieces that surprised me the most um, when I've been participating in Hill meetings is the topic of the meeting at times will be, in my case, about a statistical agency. So one of the NCES or BLS agencies. Um, oftentimes, I've been, been surprised at sort of the foundational level of knowledge that needs to be shared to start. I've been in many meetings at this point where the subject of the agency itself, what, what the agency is, uh, isn't known to, to the, the staffer. Um, so that has been, I think that kind of caught, caught me by surprise. At times these are you know, 100 million plus dollar agencies that live in their portfolio and there can be, I think, some real uh, gaps in, in awareness. And my perception is that comes from a place of it being really, seemingly really fast paced and having portfolios that are quite broad. So, it, so it's, it's not so much for lack of attention or care, it's just that breadth that is at their, at their responsibility. So it reminded me of what you're, like there's, there's just a tremendous amount of responsibility there. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, so, so from my perspective, when I, when I hear that, it, it isn't a guarantee that the thing that you care about that connects to your, your research area will be discussed in any kind of a, a meaningful context, and I'd welcome differences of, of opinion on that from up here, but that's been my experience. So if you're not well versed in where funding comes from your research, or if it is a federal source, what the agency that oversees that, those monies are, that's a real problem. Because if you're the researcher that sees those monies, uh, there's very little, little likelihood that you know, other folks will also. Um, so I, that's been kind of like that foundational knowledge piece has been really surprising to me. I would say that it's just that coffee, getting coffee is part of your job. <laughs> um, and I don't mean it to like stay caffeinated, although that's true. I mean that everything is built on relationships and on knowing people. So part of your job every week is like reaching out to people and having coffee. It is understood that that is what will happen and that you will be doing that. Um, and everyone is always doing that. And like it is understood in like the fun part of like everyone will pretty much respond and it'll be fine. But like in the sense that everything is built on relationships and so you really do just continue to grow your network. Actually, that's what I was starting to get at when I asked you whether lobbyists or constituents served as a source of information <clears throat> because those relationships are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that I found <clears throat> when I was there on, on the policy side was that there were particular people who I began, who I developed a relationship with and who I, I felt like I could trust to mm -hmm. give me honest information. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes just data, they could, the, the person in the um, New Jersey Hospital Association could get at some data on New Jersey hospitals mm -hmm. a lot faster than I'd be able to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so I found that that was an important service mm -hmm. that they, and they were eager to get me the mm -hmm. data, especially one, it fed this relationship, and two, it might be useful to, to serve their particular interests. But also I have found on the researcher side, uh, and this is working more in the state of California than at the federal level, that as I've developed relationships with the policymakers, now I'm on the other side of the, of the aisle, so to speak, or the other side of the building, um, that providing them information when they need it is a way of sort of keeping that relationship going and connecting. And so when I do have an opinion, I can say, you know, if that legislation goes through, here's what's going to happen and they'll listen to me. So being of service can actually be something that gives you conceivably an opportunity to, I, I don't want to say have a lot of, um, a lot of power, but it at least gets your, it gets your thoughts and your ideas and your your views of what the research says about something into the conversation. Mm -hmm. So on research, um, just to pursue that a little more, uh, 
we're a, at AERA, we're researchers, we're interested in research being used in the policy making process. That's one of the reasons we're there. It's one of the reasons why we want to learn about the policy making process. What did you learn about the use of research in policy making? So I, I will reinforce what you said, which is that um, certainty is very important. And so when you, we are, I think, accustomed as researchers to allowing some room for nuance, like, well, this works under these sets of conditions and really we need more studies or this study has a really low end. All of that stuff is, um, is not helpful. Um, you actually, I found myself <coughs> overstating and overgeneralizing to a point where I felt sick in my stomach, where I would be like, this, this is not right. <laughs> um, so th that's to say that the knowledge just for the sake of knowing it or the discovery is less important than how you bring research to bear to reflect the value that underlies the piece of legislation that is being put forward. So the way that research is used is, is distilled to its, just its essence and the thing that supports the perspective. So it's, it's and, and my member is a very evidence-based person and his staff are very committed to using research that is well done. Um, and this is not, this is, I, I remember being in a meeting with uh, somebody on the other side who was my counterpart, another fellow in another office, and having a discussion about what evidence was. Like, well, this is evidence. I'm like, no, that is not evidence. But the fact that that was a debatable point was odd to me. So you really have to think about research in very different ways and understand that if you don't take a stake, so if I don't put forward a very strong opinion about a piece of research that I know is not all the way done, I run the risk of somebody making a stronger case for something that I know is not right. And so you have to balance um, your sense of being a responsible scientist and researcher with how, how important is it that this move forward with enough of an evidence base that you're like, you know, I, I could stand behind this. Um, yeah, so how you situate with research is it, you, you have to take the, that uncertain orientation, the caveat orientation out of it. You have to pick, pick the thing that makes the best story and links well, um, knowing that if you don't, um, somebody else is going to put something forward that you know is, it's going to make you sick if a piece of legislation comes out and is supportive of that. So you, you, have, to take a, you have to take a stand. Any other observations? Then? Um, I would Jenna. say that, uh, you know, I, I went in sort of not with any preconceived notions, but I do know that there are some academics who I think are really skeptical um, because they look at the, maybe some of the outcomes and they think that, um, oh, policymakers must not n use research or, or know about research. But in my experience, um, I think that um, even though you know there's this idea that the staffers are young, there are some staffers, particularly if they're um, education staffers for help committee members or committee um, member that, staffers. Yeah, yeah they they or and they're older, or, a, yeah. or a member who's on the committee. You know, yeah. they they. They have a really strong, in my experience, there are some that have a really strong knowledge base, um, really a depth of knowledge of um, education policy. And, you know, they, they do kind of know the research, um, maybe not because they've read every single peer reviewed article, but because they've communicated with these folks at the intermediary organizations or with the think tanks. or And so they, um, there's this assumption that because the the bill looks this way that you must not know this about um, you know this this literature but actually it's because the bill looks this way because all these other factors went into it what the constituents are or if we design it that way is it going to do something to the member state you know or the district right mm -hmm. like will it 
you know, affect how the funding is distributed to the district. And so there's all these other, it's not this linear process of the research says this, so write the bill this way. Um, and so I think that there's a, um, you know, just because bills look a certain way or policy looks a certain way, it doesn't mean that people aren't listening to the research. Um, it's just that there's, there's lots of other um, politics and procedure. And so it's about figuring out how do you break through that, that noise. Um, and so that, I think, is uh, like more reassuring um, that there's, you know, there is a way to, like you said, get the evidence in, but, but how do you get it in? I was going to say, I think um, understanding what your role as a researcher is in your specific office also requires you learning about your member and what types of information they're most comfortable with um, and the, the, just the types of and level of evidence or information that the office has been putting out. Um, and I think that, um, so for example, one of our, we were working on a, there was a, there's, there's a HBCU steam caucus on, on the Hill and they were hosting an event and um, the senator was, was coming to, to give remarks. So he put together a memo of like, who's gonna be there and a bunch of like statistics. And so on our, um, on our, our plane ride back to DC in California, she was like making notes by hand. Um, I, I felt like I needed to like have a background in linguistics just to interpret the notes that she, <laughs> she wrote by hand. But once uh, we interpreted some of the, she was asking for things that were reasonable but not things that were just like easily accessible, right? And so the the next iteration of the memo was doing like 20 minutes. I was like, well, I can either go into the, the annals of the Bureau of Labor Statistics and piece together something, which I don't have time for, or just give her best guess um, based on what you have, right? And sometimes you have to, it, it's most important, at least in our office, for it to not be wrong and for it to be defensible. And that is like the litmus test for it to not be wrong. It'll be a fact check all the time. Um, it, some offices get fact checked more than others. We get fact checked all the time. So it's most important that it not be wrong. Um, and it'd be defensible. And you quickly learn how to give answers, um, give the closest approximation <laughs> of what an answer should be based on what you're asked to, to do. And some offices just make up the data. Oh. <laughs> uh, so anybody here who have a question? Why don't you just stand up and, oh, I guess we have a microphone because this is being recorded. I, I do, and I might just go first because it fits right with what you all are talking Great. about, if that's okay. This doesn't seem, uh, mm -hmm. um, my name's Brad Olson, and about 15 years ago when I was an assistant professor in California, I was invited with some colleagues to spend a day in Sacramento with the legislative aides who focused on education, and it was a really interesting day. And. Um, at one point we had a lunch and people were speaking a little bit more candidly. And these legislative aides who were in their 30s and 40s and 50s had worked for a couple of different governors and one of them took the lead and said very kindly to us, we really like the educational research that you do and we don't care about it one bit. <laughs> we read it, we find it rather interesting, we put it in the recycling bin, we never give it to our mm -hmm. boss. Our job is to get our people reelected, mm -hmm. and so we have to think about the political concerns, not the empirical concerns. Mm -hmm. Our job is about the next year or the next two years, mm -hmm. not a 15 year trajectory. And so the things that you all are talking about aren't really important to us. And then specifically he told a story about class size reduction. And he mm -hmm. said, I know the research, I know that the way we thought about doing it under Pete Wilson wouldn't work. We knew it was gonna be a failure, but Pete Wilson was thinking about running for president. And we knew that he wanted the teachers union on his side. And we knew that California had a budget surplus. So we decided mm -hmm. to spend all the money on an initiative that we knew wouldn't work. Cause y'all had told us it wouldn't work because that would help him a few years later when he became president. Well, he got throat cancer, he never ran for president. California lost its surplus. It had real problems. Class size reduction turned out not to work. So I became very skeptical about the ability for educational researchers to have any influence in policy making. And so that last question I think is particularly mm -hmm. important. Do you have any optimism for me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Definitely. Let's hear it. Um, I think I think you have to think about, like, all of that is true, right? Like, there are, as Jenna mentioned, like, they are not just thinking about the, poli like, the research. They are thinking about the politics. They are thinking about the optics. 
um, and they have to. Right? That's part of the job. That's part of moving things through. It's part of being able to get reelected. It's part of when you can do things. I think the optimism is in how are you doing your outreach. If you want people to sit and read your like academic writing, think again. Like that is not the audience you've written it for. It is those. I said I don't know how many times this. The three sentences that we write in our dis discussions about like the policy implications <laughs> are not helpful to policymakers. <laughs> like, they are not useful. They are useful to us to think about policy. <laughs> but like if you actually haven't asked, you better be able to translate. And I think the useful thing about this is like, mm -hmm. and the benefit of this position is you learn this language yeah. to translate. And so your job is to be like, here's like, I have this agenda item. I am going to put it in language you can understand and you can figure out how to continue to move that. So like my job isn't to say like these are the things I care about. My job with class size reduction is to be like here's how it's going to align with your boss's priorities mm -hmm. and here's how it's going mm -hmm. to be able to move and why it may or like may work and where the hiccups are going to be. And so like your job is to both like if you care, if you want to move in that direction, right? I shouldn't say your job, like you, we already have jobs, right? But like is to be able to think through how those align and how you can create that alignment. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits of being here is thinking through what are those language pieces. Mm -hmm. I also think that, so on committee, there is a long-term view. Mm -hmm. And so you're not as subject to the pressures of, you know, a year or two years. So, I remember I would be very frustrated with um, in working in the minority and the policy director would say, we don't legislate for the present, we legislate for the future. And so what that does is that it allows you to be planful and to identify moments when that research, that important research is um, tenable. It's the time that you pick it up and you can put it forward in, by translating and incorporate it. And so you, you have the perspective that you're waiting for the time and the time will come and when the time comes, you're ready with a body of evidence that you have spent some time thinking about what it means to message that research in ways that are effective. So um, I was also, I wanted to um, reinforce the idea that the staffers know a lot, but they also know people who know a lot. Mm -hmm. And the people who know a lot are experts in very narrow places. So they have one topic that they spend a lot of time gathering data, processing numbers. And so they, they're the people that you can call and say, I want to know how many people graduated from what institution in what year. They can pull that information out. So those, those relationships with experts really bring research into that space in a way that is um, agenda driven in a way that can be very positive, I think. It is a matter too of uh, being able to really think about how your research does feed the particular ideological orientation. Now, sometimes it just doesn't. I mean, there's just, and, and much of what you say is, is very much true. I mean, the, there are places where research gets in, especially if you take the long view. So it's not that you're wrong. There's huge variability in legislators, in my experience, some who are more interested and some who are less interested. Uh, uh, but um, learn, one of the things I always did with my policy class that I taught was had students write a memo convincing someone who is completely on the other side of them ideologically of the value of usually something like investing in early childhood education or something like that which would not have been their high priority. Think about it in, ter in terms that they might see the benefit of given their particular ideological perspective and, and so on. So you, you do have to become very adept at recasting and repackaging what it is you think is right based on the evidence. Other questions? Thank you so much for this panel. I've also been on the Hill fighting the census on how they were going to collect Hispanic origin and race. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions that comes to mind is, is there an opportunity for all the scholarly associations to come together and write legislation to protect the data infrastructure on race? As you know, every year there's some kind of bill to dismantle any data collection, let alone 
disaggregating race from ethnicity. And I wrote a piece in the conversation. My name is Nancy Lopez. I'm a sociologist at the University of New Mexico that says the Census Bureau keeps confusing race and ethnicity. So the experience of Afro-Latinos and brown Latinos get lumped with white Latinos, and we can't look at voting rights and even criminal justice and um, housing discrimination in a way that's meaningful. And the preponderance of the social science evidence shows there is a color line, even in poverty rates, right? Mm -hmm. The neighborhoods we live in, who gets sent to discipline, you know, who's um, uh, harshly punished. So is there a way that all of the associations, the statistical, the ASA, AERA, APA, you name it, could come together and say, <clears throat> number one, we shouldn't conflate race and ethnicity. I call it street race. If you were walking down the street, what race do you think other Americans who don't know you would automatically assume you were? Mm -hmm. That's not the same as your nationality or your mm -hmm. ethnicity, mm -hmm. and why we need um, data on the color line. So just mm -hmm. any thoughts proactively. Would there be an opportunity to have a fellow specifically working on the issues of preserving the data infrastructure for research evidence on opportunity structures and the color line. Sounds like it's tailor made for you. Th that's a great question. <laughs> thank, thank you for your question. And I think the short answer is is yes, absolutely. I think there are a lot of opportunities to, to do just that. Uh, as it pertains to the census, you mentioned the citizenship question. Uh, my, my association, one great way to do that, um, along with the American Library Association and I, the American Sociological Association, filed amicus curiae on the Supreme Court hearing for the citizenship question that will be, proceedings will that, for that will be on April 23rd. So from that legal precedent, that's one avenue where you're able to leverage status as, as experts um, to be able to have kind of that expertise shared in a kind of like that, that formal proceeding way. Um, but I do think kind of like more specifically to your question that that is possible, but the things around that require, I mean, th those are, these are going to be day to day challenges in communicating across associations, getting people to do the work to go to offices. I mean, this is not like a three to four month endeavor. This is like, <laughs> it's a long, that's a, it's a long term sustained day to day type of relationship building that needs to happen for that type of expertise and invaluable perspective to resonate in the way that it absolutely should be. And I, and I think at times now it is not, I mean, which, and that is extremely unfortunate, but I, to, I think that that relationship building across associations, that needs to happen more. And I think a lot of associations can ask yourselves, to what degree does, does that happen? It does, I mean, AERA does uh, collaborate with other associations in writing memos and mm -hmm. writing letters on mm -hmm. various mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. The, um, the other thing they do, which could be in collaboration with other societies, is briefings on the Hill uh, that are designed to raise attention to a particular issue. So I, I would talk to the government relations committee about co conceivably doing something on that topic. I think there's also embedded in your question is like that, that there, like if this were to happen, there would be change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also thinking about what the political landscape is and who are you going in and speaking to? And like, mm -hmm. right, like it, I chose my, the member, the person I'm working with because of the beliefs in that office and how I felt that they aligned with me. So there are a lot of times where I'm having constituent meetings where like I'm in agreement with them about things, but that's not necessarily true. And so you have to also be willing to lobby those other um, members mm -hmm. to be able to continue to develop and like have good relationships with them so that they're consistently thinking about that because you know, it's, it's definitely both sides of the aisle. Hello. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I have a. I guess I was a, a previous fellow on the Hill for uh, Congressman Hastings, and the letters we would get from our constituents were just kind of amazing. But I'm all about constituent public engagement. Um, I I just love things like I hate Obamacare, but I love the ACA. You know, it's just like there's so much, so much misinformation out there. 
Um, I love Bill Maher's just get on Fox, go out into the public, talk about these things. I know education is not the only topic, but I guess my question to you is, I haven't been on the Hill for a while. What's holding you back from more public engagement? Writing letters back, like if, if a constituent writes a letter, write them back about education. Here's what, it, what we're seeing. Or, we passed this legislation. Here's a follow-up on all the great things that came out of it. Um, and what holds you back from going on Fox News or going to like local news stations and talking about these matters, if, if that's the case for you guys in your offices? Thank you. I, I think I'm, I'm not quite understanding. Are you, are you suggesting there's a lack of public engagement about policy? I'm asking if, there is, if you think there is for your office, if you feel like you could be doing more on that front of informing the, your constituents and the public. Hmm. On our side, I don't think so. I mean, we're on Twitter and Instagram all day. Like, I don't, so for our office, I don't think there's a lack of, like, public engagement about the issues that are important to us. I guess going towards groups that might not think or, or see the same way as you, like, seeking more right-leaning or, or, I don't know, like, just through media seeking avenues that would think the exact opposite of how you, you all think. Like actively seeking mm -hmm. these groups. I think to some extent what you're talking about is like one totally above my pay grade. Um, in the sense that, like I think I've mentioned like this is like, the office is a team and that part of what you're talking about is through the communications team and how those are all de deciding. Like, what are we going to measure? How are we going to message it? Who are we going to spe be speaking to? Why are we going to be speaking to them? You know, all of these different issues and what are what's happening. And the other thing is like there is so much. How do I say? This? There is so much happening. Like I think that is happening. I don't know that it's happening exactly how you're thinking it, but I know that. Like I know that we are constantly, like Kendrick was saying, like putting out information. That mm -hmm. one of the things that I love about. Um, Senator Casey is that his office is committed to responding to everyone. And so we have like tons of people who are always sending out individual emails to constituents to everyone. And like that is not true of every office. If you haven't done that, make sure you like try multiple different offices and see how they all respond differently. And so I think there's both the way in which like there's that active engagement in that front, and then um, and then I think there's this broader picture. I don't I, in terms of your specific question of like why aren't we reaching out to X, Y, or Z like media sources? That I is like I, I don't know the answer to that. Well, and I don't know it's if it's it, I don't think it's ever arbitrary, right? So it's not because you're driven to do it that that you, it's the way that you reach out and the way you connect and the way that you. Um, communicate with constituents is is planned so it's not just sort of like I need to reach out to this group because um, it, it's important that they know it it's more than that it's if I reach out to this group will it have traction um, am I going to be in a space where actually that's it produces the effect that you want right because sometimes just going out there to but to say a point without uh, without a purpose uh, can be harmful to what the office is trying to achieve. Um, so in some t sometimes we're constrained because the timing is not the right timing, or the group is not the right group because there's gonna, not going to be traction there. Um, but all offices are very committed to you have to do it. Um, it just may not be, like you were saying, it may not be in the way that you're, you're talking about it. Um. And there are questions of who's listening. I mean, we, we do tend to be in bubbles and echo chambers so that the people who listen to what we want to have to say is mostly the people who agree with mm -hmm. our particular point of view. Uh, so, it, and that's a much bigger problem than I think AERA is going to be able to solve, but I think the point of ensuring that you're in conversations with people with different points of view as much as possible is a really good one. And I want to bring up that like 
that does happen on the hill. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. like yeah. constantly in conversations with people across the aisle on a variety of things. And so in levels that I don't think you see in the bigger discourse, I think that is always true. Mm -hmm. And also to that point, like we have to be mindful of what, you know, people who disagree with our policy positions think and say. And so even think tanks that are producing reports that are contrary to what we're doing. We have to read them and understand them and be able to, you know, brief our member on. And so, um, you know, yeah, you're 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 always, you know, you're, it's you're always on every side, informed. Question over here. Thank you. My name's Sheridan Dudley. I'm a visiting fellow at the University of New South Wales in Australia, and. Um, one of the reasons that I'm so interested in what you're saying today is that before I went there, and I've been a senior public servant and an academic, but I was chief of staff to the Minister for Education in New South Wales um, from 2011 to 2016 when we did the largest reforms in education, evidence-based, that's been done in New South Wales in a long time. And the experience that you have had uh, in offices resonates just like in Australia. You know, this is the political experience. and so. I have a couple of questions for you, but firstly I'd, I'd like to congratulate AEI on having this program because you are exactly the sort of people that ministers and politicians need in their offices mm -hmm. to help them get the policy right, to make it evidence-based, to make it rigorous, to do all of that stuff, because without people like you, you run the risk of making horrible mistakes in the policies and the legislation that you pass. So I think it's a great program. So coming from that and being here, here at AERA, it's my first time here, I've been to a whole lot of sessions where I've been uh, listening to policy, people who are writing what's clearly great research and concerned that they can't get the ear of the policy makers and the legislators. And I resonate with my own experience in the minister's office of people coming in and telling us about this great research and we had no clue what they were saying, what it meant, how we could use it, and we go, well, Okay, it looks interesting, we don't have time for that, we need to move on. And you've all talked about language and all of that. So my, my question is sort of twofold. The first is, how can AERA leverage the experience that you are gaining through this fellowship to help all of these people? There are thousands of people here who are doing research and some of them are doing it just for the sake of, of getting knowledge, but others actually want policies to be changed, practice to be changed. How can ARA leverage your experience to actually help all of these people who are its members to focus and write their research so they don't have to rewrite it, but so that it can be read in such a way that policy makers and politicians can capture its value easily so it can be fed into the political agenda. And you know, what lessons would you say, if you were telling your students and you're back in academia to, and telling your PhD students how to write their research mm -hmm. and they want to make a difference, what are the lessons for them? And then how can AERA leverage that for the benefit of its members? Mm -hmm. Good question. I think it's, uh, and there will likely be varying perspectives on this, but I think that the, the way that there's a, there's a general and natural tension between academia and policy worlds. Right, and so the type of writing you're rewarded for in academia doesn't necessarily dovetail with the type of writing that's effective in policy. And so unless there is a, um, so I think it, in turn what, what happens is people are forced to sort of pull double duty. I have to write the sort of like academic journals in a way that is, that is relevant for publication, but then I also have to do this other side of writing policy or briefs or op-eds or things that are effective. And it's sort of, I don't know that it's fair to sort of require people to do both things, right? Um, and I think that's a larger conversation outside of, that includes ARA, but it's also outside of ARA um, in the editors of academic journals. You know, are they gonna to begin to, to prize and prioritize um, policy relevant like research? I know that some of that happens, but I don't know that it's done at the scale that's enough for people to say, I'm going to fundamentally change the way that I'm learning and, and trained uh, how to write. And I think ARE is, is partly in hosting sessions like this is, is doing that um, in terms of leveraging our experiences with, um, 
you know, our experiences uh, with how it can be effective for the larger membership and those who, who are at this conference right now. I also want to say that I think um, I, I came out of the fellowship thinking, okay, what am I going to do with this? Like, really, what am I going to do with this? And I was very inspired by Felice's vision that what happens is that you have this experience and then you cannot let go of it. And so what you do is you go back. So I went back to my institution. I knew I was going back. There was no question that I was going to stay on the hill. But I got back and I thought, this is, I couldn't, it, it just would not leave my mind. It has not left my consciousness. And so I've been involved in ways that the kind of service that I do for my department now is I talk to faculty about this experience. I talk to faculty and I identify faculty who could come to the Hill to speak at a hearing, to go, I say, your research right now is on the docket. You should go. You should be part of a group that goes. I talk to the person who is the media relations, I mean, the government relations representative for my university who is in DC. I introduce her to faculty who I'm like, you need to do this. My classes have changed. I don't do the 20 page final paper. I do the one page ask. I talk to them about, my class is completely structured now around communication and how you're going to move your ideas to the place that it matters. Before I got on the Hill, I was very pessimistic about policy. Now I see policy as a mechanism to have a huge impact. So being able to make that connection matters more than whether I get six federal grants and I have these 10-year studies. What matters is, am I doing the work that is going to make this five sentences in the legislation change? And so I, it, it's hard to think about. I think about impact at that small level with the hope that what we do is that all my graduates, all the students that are passing through my lab and my class are changed because I am changed. And so the, the power of four people on the Hill from academia, I think, will filter in um, if what we do is go back and move forward in this, in this kind of way. Um, so I'm optimistic about that because I, I feel changed. And to, to dovetail off that, I'm sorry, oh, just real quickly, um, invite us to guest lecture. Invite us to Skype in. Um, Invite us to in New work South on Wales. Things. Are you get, trying to get yourself a trip? To no, I'm Australia? saying like, it, 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 but they're, they're, those are like easy sort of like tie-ins. You know, if you're if you're writing something, you know, invite us to co-author. Like, I I think I'm not volunteering us, but I think uh, <laughs> to varying degrees, people would be open to to things like that. Yeah. And I just wanted to um, speak to what Zoe is saying that um, I think coming off of the experience, I think also what would be helpful for researchers at AERA is also to recalibrate, I, I recalibrated my expectations about what it meant to influence policy or what it meant for education research to influence policy. Like Zoe said, it really is like a marathon. And I think, I, I think what you were saying is it's this expectation of I did this research, I did this study, and so then it should affect policy. But it's actually about the relationships and it's actually about that you are connect, you're, you're you're civically engaged, right? So you're, like, you're connected to the, the policymakers or you're connected to the intermediary organizations and you're, you're the person, like Deborah was saying, that, oh, this is the person that knows about the hospitals in New Jersey and so anytime I want to know about hospitals in New Jersey, I'm going to call Deborah, right? And so it's not that I did this study and then this study, you know, is written into the bill. It's that, you know, it's a it's sort of more of a long-term relational thing. And so, you know, that's that could be because um, you're the person that the staffer calls, or it could be that you work with an intermediary organization to get your work out there. I mean, there's lots of different ways that you um, you can do it, but um, as, as kind of Zoe was saying, it's sort of, it's sort of a long-term perspective, and so I think it's also about recalibrating expectations about what does it mean for research to impact policy. And AERA, I think, has really made a stand just by having this. Yeah. They're basically saying, it's okay 
for rigorous researchers to be interested in using research to impact policy. Mm -hmm. That it's okay to learn how to write op-ed pieces and to write yes. op-ed pieces. Yeah. And oddly, even 20 years ago, in my, in my school, people were very upset when I suggested that we bring a journalist in to teach a course on writing for the public because mm -hmm. they would that would give students the message that that's how they got tenure. And first of all, I think you can get tenure by learning how to write well. <laughs> but uh, but it, it, now it just it's a it's a mainstay of the offerings, and and many of our students are now writing op-ed pieces with approval. Yes, it's in addition to it doesn't substitute for the academic articles, but uh, but just the fact that we've we've given license for that is I think a big change. A big shift. I think we have time for one more question, and we've had one over here for a long time. Hi there. Um, my name is Kathy Adair. I'm from Texas, from Sam Houston State University, and I actually work a little bit differently. I'm a research coordinator in our Office of Research at the university, and part of what we do is try to represent these folks and we go to the state capitol and we go to, to Washington and we meet with uh, people such as yourselves and other staffers and try to communicate um, the good works that are going on at our university and try to make connections um, because it's so difficult for faculty to travel to go in and, and start building those relationships. Um, I, I want to thank you for what you're doing. My daughter was an intern on Capitol Hill on the um, Education in the Workforce Committee years ago. She's now the Chief of Staff for the Attorney General in Nevada. So she has a direct impact on policy now, at least at a state level. So um, it does make a huge difference in, in how things turn out um, in the real world. So we, we do appreciate all your efforts. Um, and I, I've taken copious notes on ways to approach and things to take and how to how to uh, not dominate conversations and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other suggestions for someone who's representing multiple faculty and all of the good work that they are doing? So, so the, I, the thing that I think is most important is um, timing of when you go and the information that you okay. provide, right? So, we often had visits from folk um, who had a general set of things that they were coming to talk about, but they got very little of our attention because there might have been some, there was something on the docket now. And so paying attention to what's on the docket, what's in the news, what are the hearings, what is the legislation that is there, and, sorry? Farm bill or something exactly. very specific. Exactly, exactly. And then filtering from among the faculty who has the work that speaks to this. So timing is so important. You were saying this, where it's like the pace is just insanity. But that, a, a role in your office, what could be an amazing role for your office is keeping track of that stuff and then making the alignment and being ready with that information on time. Um, that that's a really key part of it um, so that if it's aligned, and you time it well, and it's, even if it's just two or three, it, it can make a difference. Um, it's better than going with several things at a time when it may not be, mm -hmm. it, it may not be important. And to feed on what Zewe was saying, that timing isn't necessarily when it just hit the news, it's right before it hits mm -hmm. the news. Mm -hmm. So, because once it's in the news, it's like, it's already moving. It's done, yeah. um, And so it's, the relationships of having the staffers that like you have and being able to talk to those people about what are they hearing that's going to be coming up, right? We've, we're like, HEA is a conversation right now. HEA okay. has been a conversation for like, you just heard it, three years. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, the Higher higher Education, education yeah. Act. Um, and it's been due for reauthorization since 2008. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, but everyone's thinking it's gonna happen now because there's some other additional factors that are happening. We don't know if that'll happen, but, the fact that like that's a conversation that's been happening means that like 
both you needed to kind of know that that's been happening, and so you needed to talk to Jenna when she was there <laughs> yeah. two years ago to like get those ideas in there at that like that's the timing because um, at this point we're just like okay things are moving so we can't necessarily respond in that kind of way now. And one page in bullets that directly ties the findings to the legislative act that might use it. I'm going to thank our panelists for, wow, that was, this is fabulous. You guys uh, have learned a lot and give me hope for the future. And thank you all for our stalwart uh, hang in there to the very end um, guests. So um, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.